everybody. Welcome to the Random Red Shirt Podcast. I am one of the hosts, Zach, and the other host is Chris. What's going on, buddy? Hello, everybody. Hello, my dear friend, Zach. I'm doing well. Awesome to be here as always. Hello, everyone around the world and the interwebs and all the countries. So my wife continually teases me about opening like that, but uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, we're there's like 42 different countries listening yeah. and watching, so uh, you're not wrong there. You're yeah. definitely not wrong. Every continent except for the one you're hoping for, which is Antarctica. No. Someday. As far as we know. As far as we know. Maybe somebody's watching it on YouTube. We don't have that, you know, Oh, information. You're, I mean, I think correct. there's something in the analytics, but anyways. Yeah, you are correct. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, welcome back, everybody. If this is your first time watching or listening to us, we are a couple of nerdy guys who like to talk about all things nerdy and geeky, Star Trek to Star Wars and everything in between. And uh, if this again, if it's your first time watching or listening, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as YouTube. If you're listening to this or if you're watching us on YouTube, you can find all of our episodes on your favorite audio platform for podcasts. And this is our first episode and kind of what we're going to coin as our like Halloween series. We got three really great Halloween episodes for you as you get ready for Halloween, at least here in the United States, people who celebrate Halloween. And we're doing a couple of episodes of Star Trek, and then you're going to find, at the time of this recording, you will find another episode out, which uh, coming up pretty soon, a couple weeks, where we talk about all sorts of spooky sci-fi episodes, movies, and things like that that we think are great viewing for this time of year. Now, are you going to, uh, do you get a pumpkin? Are you going to carve pumpkins? What do you think? So I don't think we're doing that this year. Mm -hmm. we, we we've done it. We don't do it every year. It's, 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 it's hard, right? Because you, you have to like time it perfectly where you carve them yeah. and then yeah. you have to time it where they don't, they're not dead and like crumbling yeah. in on themselves before Halloween. So, um, I wouldn't say we've said no to it, but I, I don't think we're going to do it this year. Gotcha. So. We will likely carve a pumpkin. Um, so looking forward to that. We got like a, a craft pumpkin too, but we'll get a, get an actual pumpkin so nice you know that makes a mess like when you carve like it make, makes a good mess yeah and i've never done it before but i know some people like to roast the uh the pumpkin seeds in the oven and eat them oh we have done that yeah have you yeah, yeah. i've heard that i've yeah. heard they're good I, I don't think i've actually okay. ever had a pumpkin seed but i've heard that they're roasted they're crunchy and they're good and stuff but yeah um, they are good they are good. yeah so this time of year i love fall time I mean, Halloween's not my favorite time of year or my favorite mm -hmm. holiday, but I love fall time. It's my favorite time of year. And what better way to celebrate this time of year than talking about some fantastic science fiction that really gets you into the mood, right? Mm, it does. Uh, yeah. And, and we're going to specifically on this episode, we're going to talk about Star Trek Voyager's Haunting of Deck 12. If that is not maybe the most fitting title of any Star Trek episode to watch for Halloween, I don't know what is. I feel like when they created this episode, they just had a lot of fun with doing it. First with the idea, like, hey, let's make a let's make a haunting or um yeah, a ghost themed episode of Voyager. Um, I just it feels like they had a lot of fun with it. Um, from from the creators, the writers to the cast. I I'll bet they really enjoyed making Haunting of Deck 12. And I think it would have been cool if this had come out in October. Yeah. Um, this actually came out on May 17th, 2000. So it's oh. kind of interesting oh. that it came out when it did. This is a season six episode. So your second to last season of Voyager here. But it would have been cool, I think, if it would have come out around Halloween or sometime in October, or November time frame. But no, this came out in May. So maybe back then when it came out, and maybe even for those of you who've watched the episode, you've never thought of it as a... Halloween in air quotes or, you know, spooky type of episode for this time of year, but do not fret because at the time, uh, but by the time you're done watching this or listening to this episode, you will be thinking to yourself, the haunting of deck 12. I will always now consider that a spooky Halloween Star Trek episode. Hmm. That's right. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What you said. Yeah. That's right. But you said, yes. So, okay, let's jump into this because we have a lot to talk about on this episode. It's a lot of fun. Um, I wouldn't say this is one of those episodes where there's a lot of philosophicalness, deep dive to it, but, but it's certainly a fun episode, a whimsical episode that I think is uh, great that we're talking about this here in October. 
Um, and this is a Neelix centric episode. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's definitely Neelix, and it opens with Neelix like uh, in the mess hall, like shutting off the bur- the burners, and definitely Neelix. And you get to see this. I like this side of Neelix. You know, he gets to interact really well with the Borg children. So you kind of see his. Um, he's always acted well with children, but you you see his, you know, behavior there, and yeah. his storytelling. Which is very much so. Yes, very much so. And in fact, that opening scene, as you mentioned, Chris, within the mess hall, he shuts off the burners to the stove. He's straightening up the chairs, tells the computer, turn the lights off. Everything's getting dark, Mm -hmm. right? Things are getting dark. They're starting to set the mood a little bit here as in the teaser part of the episode. And then the the door opens from uh, the mess hall and accidentally bumps into seven and it startles the crap out of him basically uh and he he becomes a, a a bit jumpy because you know something happened the last time and we don't know exactly what that is yet but something has made uh neelix a little jumpy at this point yeah yeah and so neelix is jumpy but seven is asking him to hey we need you to go supervise the board children like during this shutdown of all of the ship systems, all of the ship's main power. Um, and, you know, he is glad to perform it. So, you know, that's good Good for Neelix. We need Neelix to, yeah. to do that. And he's the morale officer, so it kind of, kind of fits and makes sense, right? And we don't exactly know right away why the power is being shut down, the ship-wide power. And we learn very quickly that it's due to a nebula that they are entering, a Class J nebula. And this nebula, for whatever reason, causes things to happen. And so they have to cl- shut the power down. Um, very interesting because this is not what I would consider a unique idea in Star Trek, let alone in Voyager. Because if if we remember, Chris, one of the episodes we've watched this month to kind of prepare for Halloween was the episode one and that was also, tre- uh, uh, you know, trucking along through, pun intended, trekking along <laughs> through through another nebula. The difference was the power wasn't shut down and the crew was in stasis. But now they're going into another nebula. Yeah. And they have to shut the power down because if they don't, something bad could happen. Now, all of these nebulas, you've, you've got, I mean, this is a Class J nebula. You ran into Mutare class nebulas, Mutare class nebula. That might have been the one in in the episode one, but I'm not sure. I'd have to go look. But but all of, you've got nebulas and gaseous anomalies like creating havoc with with uh, the starships and the crew. Um, you know what I thought was was funny? Like as they were on the bridge and looking at the nebula, um, we you had Tom and Kim like remarking on the appearance of the nebula. I, I want to say someone says. Like, oh, do you see skulls like in the nebula or something like that? Um, and you have Tuvok, and Tuvok is the most Vulcan Vulcan <laughs> of all the Vulcans. Yes, yeah, for real. Yeah, just like commenting on that. Why do you guys like, there's nothing in there. Yeah. And why do you guys insist on doing that? Like you're being just childish. So yeah. always enjoy that like about about Tuvok, but he's, he's the most Vulcan Vulcan. I, I would have to agree with you on that one. I, I I think you're right there. He he's just he's not impressed by it. Now I will say, I don't know if you notice this, but the nebula, when you first see it come on the view screen, and as they're looking at it and they're they're looking through things, um they're they're seeing different images in the nebula, right? Mm-hmm. And that nebula to me looked very menacing. Very, you know, scary, spooky. It certainly fit the bill, and I think really helped uh be a part of setting the tone setting the the mood of this episode i have to go see and watch that nebula again it, you know voyager i want to go back a little bit i just want to remark on the voyager opening credits and the opening song like as i was re-watching this episode i love that opening theme song of voyager um I really, really love it. I know you love the Deep Deep Space Nine one too. I have a hard time figuring out which one I like, but Voyager, I just evokes this sense of wonderment in me. So I just really, really love that opening theme song. 
I'll be honest with you, the TNG opening, right? Mm-hmm. And the and the opening credits and the song and everything is iconic, right? I mean, it just it just is because they use that TNG theme song for a lot. But I have a hard time saying that the Voyagers isn't maybe the best in the whole franchise. Between yeah. the music, which is super catchy, it's super um contagious. Uh, the, all those opening shots with Voyager flying around and everything. It's really, really an impressive opening sequence. Yeah, I agree. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it really beautiful. is. And honestly, like when I watch Star Trek episodes, a lot of times I'll just skip over the opening credits. But I have a hard time when I'm watching Voyager to do that. Like almost every episode I watch Voyager, I'll sit back and listen to the theme song and the opening credits because it's just so good. Yeah, the the theme song or the theme music in Voyager for me is more contemplative and awe and wonder. And then TNG, TNG is very bombastic. And here we, here we go. Yep. We're, we're going to go on in this adventure. Um, so yeah, they're different and I'm glad they're different because they definitely evoke like different feelings. I agree. And I think that Voyagers, I think all the theme songs for the Star Trek shows really fit the shows. Mm-hmm. And I definitely think that's the case with Voyager because it has that real like adventure and amazement and wonder and exploration type of a feel to it, um, along with obviously the different shots that they use of Voyager flying around too. So it's yeah. very good. Um, now, I do want to make a note here because I've mentioned this in the podcast before, how much of an Edgar Allan Poe fan I am. Yeah. Anybody notice that in this opening sequence on the bridge that Tom Paris mentions he's also an Edgar Allan Poe fan? Oh, that's yes. excellent. I thought I, 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 I didn't remember him saying that when he said that i was like yes all right tom paris has good taste so <laughs> yes yeah, so so the opening sequence here with with the darkness in the in the mess hall and neelix getting startled with the kind of spooky looking nebula and the images that the crew are, are are seeing in the nebula is all setting the tone of what we're about to get into here in the haunting of deck 12 and after the opening sequence open opens, that's kind of redundant, I guess. But uh, across the ship, we have different panels and light shutting down, uh, sick bay shutting down. In fact, even the doctor, I believe, also turns himself off. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Astra, Astrometric 7 of 9 is powering everything down and, and going dark. Cargo Bay 2's power is going down. And that's where the Borg alcoves are with the Borg children. And so they're regeneration cycle is cut short because of that they wake up and the lights are slowly going out and the neelix is there he's got a lantern he's got some snacks and he's trying to help you know calm them down we also see engineer the engineering crew shutting everything down including the warp core and so all over the ship you're seeing the lights down the hallways go down lanterns coming on and then on the bridge Ensign Kim, the one who does never gets, you know, the one who never gets uh, promoted, lets everybody know the shutdown's been complete. And Janeway calls Seven and tells her that they're ready. Seven acknowledges, and now Voyager is literally gliding through the nebula, um, from its the power it had been exerting from the engines before, and that's it. And so now we've gotten to where the the ship is dark, it's eerie, it's spooky. Everything shut down, and we've now set the tone for the rest of this episode and the mood in which it presents. Yeah, that's right. And so now that the tone is set, Neelix has to go on with the job that he's supposed to do, which is entertain and take care of the the Borg children. So, you know, he does do that. He goes to where uh, the children are and, you know, explains to them, hey, we've got to cut down main power. Um, And he tells them that this is to prevent EM emissions from entering the ship from the nebula and it gives them excuse to spend some time together and gives Neelix an excuse to tell them a, a story. I like that. Um, first, the, first of all, the Borg children, I feel were a great addition to Voyager and that there were multiple children was, I feel a great addition to Voyager because you get, um, a variety of ages, you know, if you have the younger yeah. children and you have the older children, like the oldest one, I believe is Icheb, and, and Icheb, he's the oldest one. And, and 
um, he's still a child, but he feels like he has to behave like he's the oldest. So he has to behave like he knows uh, like everything. And in this episode, you get to see that interplay between the younger Borg, Borg children, like in each episode. So I thought that that was great um, and really lends itself well, really well to this uh, to this episode. I agree. And because of that, you have this sort of campfire ghost story mm -hmm. type of setting, right? That's, that's really what this episode is. It's a, it's a campfire ghost story that Neelix is telling, right? Now, we don't know. He's kind of playing it off as, you know, well, is it true or not? We don't know. He's trying to he's, – he's kind of doing it to kind of, you know, poke at the kids and, and, and uh, get them maybe a little spooked but not too much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so – with all of this happening, the kids are beginning to ask questions, right? And they're saying, you know, asking if the shutdown has anything to do with deck 12, right? Which yeah. apparently uh, the, the little girl was told by Naomi Wildman that it was haunted. Uh, Icheb, who's the oldest, as you said, uh, was, in, was informed that the section 42 of that deck is closed to all but senior officers with a level six security clearance. Ah. Yeah. And so Neelix tries to play it along like, oh, there's no such thing as ghosts. But they keep they keep on asking the question. They're kids, right? And that's yeah. what makes this fit. Because if it was adults, the the same feel, the, the way everything plays out wouldn't be the same, right? Yeah. And so they continue to ask questions and everything else. And they're like, well, if it's not a ghost, what is it? And he finally says, okay, well, let me tell you the real story of deck 12 which is where i think there might be some embellishment here uh you know a little bit over the top on some things in order to make this story kind of pop for the kids yep yep absolutely um which is great and i love that um it's naomi wildman and, and even though she's not so much in this episode but you yeah. naomi wildman Another child is the one that says, yeah, we think that deck 12 like is haunted. And you could totally see that like amongst these kids, them kind of generating some fable or some myth amongst yeah. themselves. Like, hey, I think part of the ship is haunted. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just like. Yeah. And, and the, the only kid up to this point who has ever been born on Voyager, right? She was the first child born on Voyager. Wow. That's right. Uh, and so. It's kind of fitting because she's a kid who has literally grown up on the ship. She doesn't know what it's like to live on a planet. She doesn't know anything else. And so she's kind of making it fun now that she has other kids around, you know, and telling these kind of stories and everything else. Um, so it's interesting, you know, because we get that point where Neelix is around the the campfire in air mm -hmm. quotes or, mm -hmm. or the lantern and they've got the snacks and he's beginning to tell this story. And he talks about how it was several months ago before the, the board kids had come aboard the ship which makes sense because he's telling them something that supposedly happened that they can't actually say oh no that didn't we were there that's not how it worked he has to go back before they were there right yeah and this really all goes back to uh you know being in another nebula another j, j class nebula gathering deuterium and um in the mess hall, they were the ship was jolted by turbulence. Yeah. And and Tuvok walks in and Neelix sits with him and he's attempting to kind of, you know, try to to play off the fact that he's not uh, you know, he's uneasy about it. And I think Neelix even says something to the effect of, well, you know, maybe the captain will let you hang some curtains <laughs> to ease yeah. your mind or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. Because Neelix uh recounts to Tuvok that as he was a child on Talaxia. Um, he, a nebula came into their system and, you know, ever since then, he's been very scared of, of nebulas. Yeah. I, I tell you that these nebulas, nebulas, like just, they continue to cause havoc. Right. So, so they do. Yeah. yeah. Because I think the, 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 whatever it was, the nebula, whatever it was that came into this, the Talaxian system, uh, it blocked out the stars and the moon, I believe. And so it was ah, just yes. kind of like fearsome, gruesome looking thing hanging over. And that, I mean, as a kid, that probably would, you know, make you scared. And so Neelix has carried that fear into adulthood. Yep. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, so we're looking at something that supposedly happened months ago and Neelix is, you know, telling this story. He's telling telling it from his point of view. And uh, so on the bridge, 
Janeway, Chakotay, the other people that are there, they also feel this jolt and um, things that are happening. Uh, the, there's some kind of destabilization within the nebula. Chakotay, you know, tells Janeway that, um, you know, hey, look, things are aren't really that great. We're going to have to be satisfied with the fact that our bustard collectors have, you know, got about 80% of the deuterium they want and they're going to have to get out of there. So Janeway's like, yep, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, stop, stop bringing any more in, get the ship out of here. But just as P Tom Paris is about to get out of there, the ship is shaken again. That's right. It is shaken again. Um, and then those in the, in the mess hall, they see some sort of energy discharge happen and spread over the ship. And I think this is where, you know, skipping ahead a little bit, but I think this is the entry point on whatever strange entity has like yeah. got gotten into the ship. Right. So yeah. um this this kind of electrical energy discharge like has a spider web pattern that appears and then disappears. You've got sparks flying away. Um, you know, and then that's essentially it's this discharge that's penetrated the hole. Um, and yep. you've got multiple damage around the ship that they have to um, take care of. And, you know, J Janeway orders repairs of the ship's, uh, you know, systems and says, Hey, resume the ship's course. Yeah. And this is where Neelix and, you know, I love how it bounces back and forth between the story that's being told and then back to yeah. him and the kids. And this is where Neelix basically says, hey, you know, everything at that moment seemed fine. But mm -hmm. what they didn't realize was that they had a stowaway on board. That's right. Some sort of, st <laughs> yeah, stowaway that can live in a nebula, like apparently. Yeah. yeah. And what's. What what I what I love is how the kids are like, oh, I know what it is. Was it was it this? Was it this? Was it that? You know, they're trying to guess what type of life form or thing it could be. And so Neelix basically gives them the option of, hey, do you, do you guys want to keep playing the guess the species game, or do you want me to keep going on with the story? And they're like, all right, well, go ahead and continue. But you know, they 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 were trying to understand what exactly was going on. They wanted to know the specifics. They wanted right. to know the species, and I think they they even went as specific as, "Hey, is it species eight four seven two? If I get the number right, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what the number it was, but you know, being Borg, right? They have all these species designations in in their yeah. minds from when they were the Borg, right? So that's right. Yeah. So uh, they continue the the story continues, and and Neelix begins retelling all these different malfunctions, all these different things that were happening across the ship once they left the nebula. They're, here they're thinking, oh, they're out of the nebula. Everything's going to be good now. But once they left the nebula, that's really when all the stuff really, you know, the proverbial crap hit the fan at that point. Yeah, that's right. And you've got, um, you know, soon after that, you get to see some of this uh, malfunction happening right before their eyes. You have Chakotay entering um, the captain's quarters. And you know, Captain is doing what she usually does. She loves her. She loves her coffee. Very, very fond of her coffee. She loves her uh, coffee. Yeah, right here. that's that's right. That's right. Let me see let's that. See if I can, let me see if I can bring her into the picture here a little bit. Oh, uh, is that the XO six? It is. Yes, she's got her coffee. As you oh, can see. Out, that's right. Outstanding. Yeah. Maybe maybe I'll put her over here in the corner. She can keep an eye like yes. right there. Keep yes, an eye put her in the corner. Sure. For those yeah. of you on audio, we've got an awesome. XO6 figure of Captain Janeway with us. With with her coffee mug. That's right. She is because famous. we know there's coffee in that nebula. <laughs> there is coffee in that nebula. Yeah. yeah. Coffee. But yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to go on on a side that coffee plays a very important part in Star Trek from DS9 it does. to Voyager. Yeah. Yeah. With the rack to, the Klingon coffee, the rack to Genos and, yeah. and Voyager. And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't remember seeing. I mean, I'm sure they do, but in Enterprise, do they drink a lot of coffee? I don't remember seeing a ton of coffee or them really mentioning it a lot in that oh, show. Yeah, I don't recall too much coffee in Enterprise. But you're either. right. Yeah. For whatever reason, DS9 and Voyager were the most caffeinated shows in Star yeah, Trek. They were. I mean, oh. we started with the Earl Grey tea in um, TNG, right? That was that was Yeah, it was beverage. tea first. It was coffee. tea. Yep. yep. That was the highlighted beverage and. Yep. TNG and then we went to Rectochinos and Cappuccinos essentially and then yep. to coffee. 
Yeah, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. Um, but you're right. He does. So Chakoti does go to her room. Uh, they're realizing that the power issues and the damage across the ship is significantly more than they thought. Uh, and so one of the transporters was out. Uh, sonic showers were offline. Deck yep. five lost all of its gravity. Um, Ensign Mul Mul <laughs> Mulcaney, or however you say his name, hit his head on the ceiling. Uh, and in fact, I also believe this is where she goes to replicate coffee, and the coffee comes out, but there's no cup, and it just goes everywhere. I have a blob. Yeah, yeah. She she takes a sip of the coffee in her hand and just like, oh, this is this is terrible. And yep. um, yep. And she's trying to replicate a new one, turns into a blob, and this is going to be bad because if Janeway cannot have her coffee, uh, it's going to be a bad. She's going to have a bad, bad day. That's very uh, true. Yeah, very true. Yeah. yeah, and interesting. So she gets her. She does finally get a cup of coffee, and she looks out the window of her ready room and notices a meteor or an asteroid or something like that, some kind of cluster of stuff. Yeah. And she tells Chakotay, she's like, hey, that I, I think we've seen that before. Do you recognize that? And I don't think he does. And then she's like, no, we, we've been here before. And so they then realize quickly once on the bridge that they're actually going in circles. Yeah. And this is where we find out that there's some type of navigational sensor issue that's going on here. Yep, yep. And then she's with this issue, you know, Janeway's like, hey, let's uh, do an all stop. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's recalibrate our sensors. And Paris is obeying. Um, but as, as he's obeying, as he's saying, okay, let's do that. Something happens, I believe, at this point. Yes. Know, the the yes. warp drive engages. Um, ship is surging forward. And... Paris is trying to disengage that. I think this is where T Paris gets um, shocked. I gets zapped, here. yeah. Yeah, totally gets zapped. And uh, then they've got to take... And uh, they've got to take Tom Paris as soon as they can down to sickbay to get treated. Yep, he's got a lot of burns all over him and everything, yeah. electrical burns. Um, yeah, and they're finding other things, right? So, so they finally shut everything down, but then the warp drive gets shut down. The ship comes to stop again. Uh, comm systems are going down because they ca can't contact engineering. Uh, Chakotay tries to uh, ask the computer, you know, where where uh, where things are at. That's not working, and things are really they're failing quickly. A lot there's a lot of issues happening. They're really not sure why this is happening why the ship was going in circles and what is what is the cause of all these different shipwide failures very much like a poltergeist that they're setting up this episode to be yeah so that's a good point it. i didn't think about it that way but you're right yeah 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 so all of these malfunctions are on the ship you know they can't control it they don't know what's happening um so i i i thought that was good i liked the uh, part where Chakotay was in the turbo lift and the turbo lift was malfunctioning and then went really, really fast. And, um, you know, you don't, uh, you assume that uh, Chakotay like must have been like, <laughs> like injured, uh, but he does finally make his way to engineering. Yeah. That it, that's true. Yeah, uh, I mean, and he's he he has an issue too with like the door wasn't open, then they keep closing and opening and closing mm. and. You know, uh, it, it's it's really a mess, right? It's really, really a mess. And the that's just one of many things. In addition, you're getting issues with the bio neuro gel packs, which are a huge part of the ship and, and the way it operates. In fact, I believe it's, I believe the Intrepid class ships were the first ships in Starfleet to operate with the bio neuro gel packs, the... if I remember correctly. I believe they were. I, and I thought that was a really, really cool idea because whenever they do di diagnostics on the bio neuro gel packs, they talk about the, syn the synaptic patterns in the, yeah. in the gel packs and that breaking yeah. down. And so the gel packs here were also like um, a feature, I believe, of the episode one uh, with, with Seven and the Doctor Two, and they were having problems with the gel packs. You know, and the... After the Intrepid class ships, you know, who knows if they're using 
jail packs anymore because they're having a lot of problems with these jail packs so uh, yeah well uh, and especially when you're you're far, far away from home right there's mm -hmm. there's no like <laughs> there's no service station to pull up and rotate your tires uh it, it because you're so far away from home so that i'm certain that certainly plays into it yeah yeah but I, there's another yeah. oh sorry go ahead no 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 go go ahead oh i was just gonna say there's another instance where you get crewman tall tall i think mm -hmm. that's how you say her name and she's she's come over to run some diagnostics on some panel in the hall in a hallway. Seven of nine goes over is like, hey, what are you doing? Like, you know, you caused this. And she's like, what are you talking about? I haven't even started working yet. Right. And so this is another scene that continues to set up this idea where stuff everywhere is failing. Yeah, I liked I thought that interaction between um, that crewman and seven was funny. So the crewman, she was, you know, pretty innocent, just doing her job, had just yeah had just kneeled down to open the panel and here comes seven and seven sins get away from there. And, and then, Oh, you, you caused whatever malfunction to happen and you have seven just jumping to a conclusion and then being rather annoyed at whatever the crewman was saying after that in typical yes. like seven fashion. So I like yep. that. Absolutely. And you get, you also get on deck 13, you have Chakotay and Torres, Torres, mm -hmm. not Torres, Torres <laughs> who are examining the, the, the gel packs that they mentioned and it looks like one one's in good condition or they appear to be in good condition but um some type of em discharge uh seems to be moving through the systems and so we're getting these things all these surges and these things happening that's starting to point to it might all be related instead of it just being random right it 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 seems to be related in some way mm -hmm. even things like environmental controls um all sorts of stuff is happening. Cargo in Cargo Bay Two Seven is at a terminal running diagnostics, trying to figure out the source of the malfunctions, and she's unaware that this EM discharge uh, had entered the room. All this like almost looks like lightning a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, electricity yeah. of some kind, and it's behind her and it exited the panel. And now it, it, you can tell it's like okay, this is the first time I think in the episode, Chris, where we see this thing, this this. This entity, this uh, creature, this whatever it is, moving, right? It's not just some, like, discharge coming off a panel. It's actually moving in some way. And yeah. I think this is the first time we kind of see that where, as an audience, if this is the first time you're watching it, you're like, oh, okay, I think we start, we're starting to see the, the cause of all this and the bad guy of the episode. That's right. And it kind of looks like this cloud of gas that um, is now following Seven, and so she yeah. exits the area as soon as she can, but it follows her, I believe. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Seven's trying to get out of there, but I believe Seven ends up being locked in a section um, or, like, trapped in a section as this gas was kind of um, getting closer and closer and closer to her. It, that's true, yes. And she tries to open the door initially, it won't open, and then she has to go over and do the manual override mm -hmm. and get it to work, and finally she gets the doors open. Uh, but it's it's not without fright a little bit. You can tell Seven's a little nervous at first, um, but she's able to, like I said, she's able to get it open. Uh, the, the unfortunate part, though, is she walk, gets out of the uh, cargo bay, and now there's force fields up at, mm -hmm. immediately after the door, and that's where this cloud encircles her, and then she she falls over unconscious. Yeah, that's right. And now we switch. You know, this we talk about the the switching of scenes, but we switch back to Neelix, and the children are very, very much engaged and kind of worried about uh, about this. And you start the children become startled because the lantern light goes out. So that's great. And uh, you know, they inadvertently get, get scared. And then he's yeah. got to change the light that can continue. Yeah, it, it makes it almost basically pitch black, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it definitely scares them. You can see it. Once the light comes back on, their their face is definitely scared. And I think Neelix is maybe taking a little bit of pleasure in this, right? Like, yeah. you know, giving them a little bit of a little bit of a scare, a little bit of a startle. Uh, but he continues the story. And so we jump back into the story he's telling, and Chakotay and Torres have now gotten to the cargo bay using none other than the Jeffries tubes, which we've had this question, this this uh, topic before 
about the Jeffries tubes we and did. why in the world they have those metal plates, that metal stuff on the <laughs> on the ground. Anybody who would have to work in those Jeffries tubes would just shred their knees. Yeah, they need they totally need knee pads when they're crawling through that. Um, no, they so need have, carpet in there, Chris. They gotta have yeah. carpet or something soft. I mean, come on, something, something. Yeah, yeah, something. They totally did. They were also in the. They went through the Jeffries tubes in the episode one on Voyager again. Uh, yes, uh, this was seven, and the doctor going through. And someone, someone makes the comment. Maybe the doctor makes the comment, like, "Why didn't they just make these Jeffries tubes like regular height so just people could walk in them and do maintenance on it?" <laughs> Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, I I don't know. I'm sure it's something to do with space on board the ship, right? Uh, you only have so much yeah. space, I guess, or something. But yeah. but uh, yeah, so Chakotay uh, and Torres reach Seven. They find her unconscious behind the force fields. And they try to get the computer to drop the force fields, but it's not working. So he literally has to shoot the computer panel on the wall in order to, to cut the power and drop the fields. And then they're able to get Seven and quickly get her to sick bay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and meanwhile, like, um, it cuts to the mess hall with Neelix, like, cooking in the kitchen uh, while, you know, the crew members, including ops manager Kim, they're just sitting there eating and talking. The lights start to flicker in there. Kim calls engineering. And, you know, Kim essentially says to Neelix is wondering what's going on, is what's going on. But Kim says, hey, to Neelix, uh, stay like in your station this is your post let me go figure out yeah. what's going on and so then kim kim leaves um so that leaves you know neelix in the mess hall like alone again then then the lights go out leaving yeah. him in darkness and then you see neelix and, kind of whimpering yeah and all the only light he has is from the fire from his cooking oh, that's yeah, it yeah i like that's that. it so it's yeah so again if, if you're watching or listening to us as we've been talking about this it's it's the the tone, it's the mood, it's the way in which they've set this episode, right, to be spooky. I mean, literally the name, the haunting of Deck 12, it makes sense, right? So you've got darkness, you've got little, a very little amount of light, which we're going to see more of that here coming up. And you've got a scared Neelix all by himself in the same place he started the beginning of the story. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yep, Neelix is saying that systems after systems are failing. Um, the environmental controls are failing. Neither the warp engines or the impulse engines or any means of propulsions are ex responding as they're going through this nebula and essentially like they are dead in space. Um, and now the environmental controls are making the, everything like uncomfortably hot for everyone except like Tubok. Yeah, which is which is of course right because he's Vulcan. I mean, now that's... Tu yeah, Tuvok says something like ridiculous. Saying someone asks him, like, "Well, don't you sweat?" And Tuvok says something, oh, "Not until it gets to like some ridiculous temperature, Kelvin." Yeah, like, yeah. wow, okay. He should go, he should go hang out with the Tholians. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember we should... talked about in a mirror darkly in the Enterprise and the Tholians. They freeze them because they're such a hot, hot climate uh, species. Yeah, yeah, he totally should go hang out. Authorities. yeah for sure mm -hmm. um yeah. yeah so we we go we go back to the bridge and uh, or we're on the bridge i should say and the consoles are starting to beep again and paris is, is uh uh paris checked it yep. due to janeway's orders and they found that hey the helm controls are working again and yep. they try to get the engines back online but unfortunately there's something else going on, and uh, oh no, actually, is now this, he's hit. Yeah. Oh, this is where he's hit. Yep. Yeah, this is where he's hit. This is where he's struck, and so he's struck in the face by the discharge. He's severely burned, and so unfortunately, she tries to call sick bay. No answer. Transporters aren't working. They're offline. Now the computer's saying that the oxygen depletion is happening. Air is being removed from the bridge. They try to get emergency power back to the air. doesn't work. They got to get off the bridge. Everyone starts coughing and gasping for breath. And uh, it's 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 pretty dire on the bridge. And in fact, in sick bay, we go to there now, and the doctor is treating seven of nine along with other injured crew members. So Paris is laid on the bed and he he looks he looks rough, right? Um he he's really struggling. 
Mm-hmm. This is kind of where we get it. I want to say ho- the horror part of it, but this is kind of where we get some more of that, like, okay, there's some injury, some blood kind of stuff. This is some of the por- part of that scariness of the episode. They're in danger. They're yep. in danger. Yep. yep, exactly. It's not Jason. It's not, uh, <laughs> you know, Mike Michael Myers, but it is some type of scary entity uh, that's that's roaming around the ship through the systems, causing all sorts of havoc. Yeah. And as we as we continue to move through the episode, this is where we begin to see that it looks as though, again, this stuff's not random. It's not happening by chance. There's some type of possible intelligence at work here, especially when they realize that the um, – or, or excuse me, this is when they realize that the, this discharge that's happening was actually a life form from the nebula that has actually entered the ship. Yeah, and any time they try to alter the course – of the ship to go away from the nebula or go away from the destination that this entity wants, uh, you see something negative happen, something bad happen, whoever's trying to make that move. So um, yeah, uh, that is definitely something that they're realizing that's that's happening and going on through the ship. Um, And it's kind of cool how how they're putting the puzzle together. Exactly. And they don't know if this entity is hostile or not, right? Mm-hmm. For all they know, this thing could be trying to kill them, and it kind of seems like it is, right? They don't know its actual reason. We won't find that out till the end, towards the end of the episode. But uh, we see the dark corridors. We see the blood red emergency lights that we've seen on, on Starfleet ships before. Why they chose that color of red, I don't know, but it really makes for a good spooky episode for sure. Um, and uh, this is an interesting scene. Coming up here because so Kim's walking through. He's got the you know the wrist lights on him, looking for people. He comes around a corner and who do we find? A frightened crewman, Talsis. She's the one who you know was yelled at by Seven to get away from there. You're you you did something bad, and she accidentally hits Kim in the stomach because she thinks he's some kind of oh, I don't know in, nice. invading alien or yeah. something like that. Uh, he's a little bit upset at first, but says, Hey, look, you know, we've not been invaded by aliens. We just, we, I'm headed to engineering. She's like, well, can I go with you? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so they start walking the halls together with that dark blood red, mm-hmm. you know, emergency lights flashing. It's a little bit of a creepy scene there for sure. It is. She adds some a little bit of levity, uh, for a few minutes into this yeah. episode by, you know, saying, uh, like, is it aliens? Is it the Borg? Is it the, um, the Hirosh, I'm gonna get their names wrong. Herosians, Herosians, Her- like, and Kim's like, "Why do you, th- why do you think that?" She's like, "Well, isn't that what they would do? They would yeah. turn off the power, uh, if they." And she's not wrong, I'm sure. So, yeah, that's what they would do. So, that is true, and I, I love this part because so now we jump back to Neelix talking about the fact that you know he was alone in the darkened mess hall for over four hours, no idea what was going on, and he began to hear noises outside. And all he had was a phaser. And so he is he's taking this story, this ghost story, right, that he's telling the Borg kids. And he's telling them all the different details of what's going on on the ship. And then he brings the story back to to remind them that, hey, this story is about me, guys. I was scared this whole time. You have to understand what was going on. And Mm -hmm. really trying to get as much scary, spooky details into it to give the kids as much of a fright as he can. Yeah. And so as he's going out, I, I really like this scene because um, Neelix is hearing a noise and he turns the corner and he sees what the source of the noise is. And it's the turbo lift doors coming in and out, in and out, in and out. And um, it's an unsettling scene because you just see that and you're going like, why is that happening? It's, really, it's very really weird. creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching this without the lights on and I was like, I think I need to get up and turn a light on. <laughs> this is kind of, I mean, it really, really is because if you through Voyager, right? And you watch this episode at any other time of the year besides around Halloween. It's not it's not as as creepy. But this time of year, when you're already kind of in that that mindset, I felt like it kind of added more to this. And I certainly found this scene, as you said, very unsettling. Yeah. Yeah. And as Neelix approaches, he's approaching, trying to see what's happening. And this was one of this is a good use of the jump scare because you know, yeah, right? New uh, Neelix is startled. He turns around and there's Tuvok, but he doesn't know Tuvok. And, and the way they angle the shot 
you know, you don't know is uh, kind of looks like maybe Tuvok is a zombie or whatever. And Tuvok has a uh, an oxygen mask. Oh, on, yeah. Yep. Right. So he looks uh, different. So that was a great uh, shot right right there. And then, of course, Neelix is really startled. And Tuvok's like saying, well, you know, you need to calm down. And he's explaining that he's got the oxygen mask because the environmental controls are are off. Um, and, you know, they need to go to engineering together. So that was probably one of the best jump scares of this episode. Yes, 100%. And the the line where Neelix says, hello, is anyone there? Is very a very classic, like, scary, creepy oh. type of line in an episode, right? Where somebody's in the dark. They've got a little light. They can't see everything. They don't know what's going on. And they're like, hello, is anybody there? Can you, you know, that to me is a great to the the history of scary movies. Um, it's somebody's alone in the dark. They've got a light on, but they can't see everything. And they're calling out into the darkness, mm-hmm. trying to find someone else to help alleviate their, their fear. And that's exactly what's going on here. And then when, when, when Neelix shows up and it startles the crap out of, out of Neelix, sorry, Tuvok shows up and startles the crap out of Neelix that, and he screams and he almost shoots him. Uh, that, that was, you're right. That was a great jump scare. Very um, indicative of, of what this type of episode is, which is that suspenseful jump scare type of, uh, you know, episode. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was good. So Neelix and Tuvok make their way down to engineering and on the way, you know, Neelix is trying to make conversation with Tuvok and, you know, that never works with, with them. So <laughs> no, it just, no. it does. But Neelix is not going to give up. He he can't give up on, on, on his Vulcan friend. Yeah, he can't, he can't. And they, they have a, they have a great relationship throughout Voyager, right? So you, you uh, there were several episodes where, where Neelix, Neelix always felt, um, he felt bad because he felt Tuvok was just uh, ignoring him or always putting him down or, you know, never, never, you know, thought much of him. But they really at at the end and you see uh, how Tuvok was like in that episode where where Neelix is going back home to his Talaxian family. And, you you know, you see Tuvok paying tribute, this very meaningful tribute to to Neelix. They have a great relationship. So. I think so, and there are several relationships in Star Trek that mm-hmm. initially come across as annoyance by both parties or one party, and over time, you see moments where you're like, okay, yeah, it's like almost like a love-hate a little bit, but you know that there is a friendship, there's a, there's a kindling there yeah. amongst them. Um, th- this is certainly one of those Um there's another I, I won't I won't go into DS9, but there is another <laughs> another relationship from that show that's very similar to this. Um and, and, and across Star Trek as a whole, I think. Uh in fact, yeah, and I've actually there's a couple of relationships in DS9, but yes, this is one of those relationships. And I, I think you're right. It's 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 really wonderful. I always love the scenes with Tuvok and Elix. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. But Janeway and uh, other members from Sick Bay, they've all gathered in engineering, right? It's one of the few places with some light on. They can work with the computer and so forth. And, uh, you know, Chakotay's being a good first officer, right? He's making sure that the crew's accounted for. And he says, you know, that there, there there's 90 other crew members accounted for in other areas of the ship. Um, and Seven is working with Torres. She's trying to get the system uh, wrestled back from whatever this alien thing is but they're they're just not having success and uh and then what's in a funny kind of lighthearted moment the computer starts to report where janeway's location is in main engineering and some kind of you know mal they think it's a computer malfunction at first but then they start to realize that this alien thing is using the computer and using the vocal part of the computer to communicate and specifically to communicate to janeway mm-hmm yeah, and Janeway's putting together those pieces and asking, are you trying to communicate? And I think the computer says like affirmative. Yes. Or something yes. like that. Yeah. Very Terminator esque. <laughs> That's right. You can't um, say affirmative or something like that. You gotta say no problemo. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then Janeway's gotta ask though, why are you here? Like trying to connect with the entity. And then the entity's like, well, 
report to astrometrics. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems very foreboding, yeah. right? To say report to astrometrics, especially you don't want to go alone. Like, oh, okay, this entity yeah. is saying report over to this area. Um, she doesn't, of course. Like, you know, she she takes uh, seven of nine with her. But absolutely, absolutely, and so. Yeah, her and her and seven arrive in the astrometrics, and the aliens saying, "Hey, you need to pull up the navigational logs." They, you know, you see the nebula, and through this whole thing, you begin to see from a different perspective. I think, right? This goes from a like a really creepy episode with this some kind of like poltergeist kind of thing, as you said, to now saying, "Okay." There is a reason why this stuff is happening around the ship. This alien isn't necessarily hostile. And Janeway's learning very quickly that it is actually trying to get home. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and now, at this point, this is now where the alien wants her to report to the bridge. Yeah. So she goes to the bridge, uh, but there's some level 10 security clearance in the way. Um, which only she has, so she's able to get on. Yeah. And very smart by this this poltergeist thing because only the captain has that, which means only she can enter and Seven can't go with her. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Captain's eyes uh, only. So, like, as the captain is going up to the bridge, you know, she's developing this rapport with the alien, this relationship with the alien and, and realizing like, Oh um, yeah, we took the alien away from its home. Like essentially yeah. on accident, uh, on accident. Yeah. 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 And it all had to do with the, I think the Boussard collectors at the time, always using those Boussard collectors <laughs> in the wrong way. Yep. <laughs> And unless you're in Star Trek Insurrection, where they use it as the Riker maneuver, right? When when uh -huh. Levar, when, remember, when, remember, remember when um, yeah. Jordy's like, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if history remembers this is the Riker maneuver, and he's like, if it works, you know, and they, right. they they collect all the the gases around them, and then they release them in front of the sona, and they shoot it and blows up in their face. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's once good. in a while they'll use them, but in this case, yes, they're using them, and it has negatively affected a life form, right? Yeah, that's right. And so. She uh, uh, she's basically telling this life form, you know, yeah. that uh, it, it's going to that they can't really get back to the nebula the way the, quickly or whatever. And that the the destabilization of the nebula was continuing. There was something going on with this life forms home. And this really, really angers this this life form. Yeah, and so this is where then the life form starts cutting off life support and all the decks, and sends out a message through through using the ship's systems to say abandon ship, and so it's almost like the the, the this life form is like, oh well, if you you guys by going through the nebula destroyed my home, I'm now going to destroy you. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is furious about that. Yeah does say abandon ship abandon ship and is like essentially going to you know trying to kill um Janeway I believe yeah like at the same time you know Jane Janeway's saying hey we can take you to like uh like a different nebula um but if you kill me like you'll never never get to go um so she kind of plays that the whole way through and finally like at the very end I think it stops like yeah. and it, it spares Janeway's life, but it, but it tries to suffocate her. It tries to kill her. And she basically plays a game of chicken yeah. with the alien, right? Like, you know, go ahead, you know, do this X, Y, or Z, but we're not going to be able to get you home if that's the case. Yeah. And so she, she's left the bridge. She's tried to return to engineering, um, you know, to tell the crew members, hey, this is, you know, don't abandon ship. Uh, it's not, it, this This is not, you know, don't listen to what that's, what's going on. Unfortunately, they had abandoned ship. And so uh, 
it's 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 just really building up at this point, right? E- to the point to where, uh, you know, gases are released into the tube where, you know, Tuvok and Neelix are, and you know, Tuvok is struggling to breathe, but ne- and Neelix is he's like, just leave me here, whatever. Neelix is like, I'm not. You're we're gonna continue on, Mister Vulcan, or whatever he says. Yeah, yeah. Like so, like this part, right? So Tuvok gets injured by the. Uh, like another discharge they're they're seeing the gases uh tuvok's been helping neelix um but tuvok tuvok's injured and i like that part in typical vulcan fashion right so tuvok's there lying on his back saying mr neelix logic dictates that you must carry on with the mission now (laughs) and you must leave me and take the oxygen mask and neelix is like uh no i'm not gonna leave you dude so yeah (laughs) exactly like that and and so this is the but and this is where you know Neelix is telling the kids you know hey Janeway tried to Janeway tried to make the alien reconsider she's trying to plead with him she's trying mm-hmm. to to uh, uh, negotiate with the alien saying look if 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 we if I die and everybody's off the ship eventually the ship's gonna you know it's gonna drift and then it's gonna get destroyed by something at some point and you're gonna be and you're gonna die too you're not gonna have a home mm-hmm. and you won't be able to survive mm-hmm. either. And but but the, this this creature it just seems just bent on killing, uh you know, the people on Voyager because of what happened to its home, mm-hmm. and so Neelix again tells the children, hey, uh she couldn't wait any longer. She went to engineering, ordered everyone to get the escape pods and the shuttles, and and uh, you know, um as Neelix and and Tuvok climb out of the Jeffries tubes just in time to join them. They launch all but one on which Chicote was to leave with Janeway. And just as Janeway is about to go through the door to get into the pod, it shuts. And it had been listening to what she said. And this is where now the alien creature or, you know, entity basically decides it's going to keep just one person on board to keep the ship running long enough. And that's Mm -hmm. Janeway. Mm -hmm. And it tells her, you know, go to engineering. She refuses. She's not going to be some prisoner. It's going to have to kill her. And this is where we get into um, the, the, the game of stalemate, right. Between Mm -hmm. the alien and, and, and Janeway and Janeway, of course, as we know, they're not going to kill off the captain, right. Janeway uh, ends up calling the creature's bluff. And it finally, you know, removes the gas, drops the force fields, restores everything back to the ship, and that it would accept her proposal of finding a new home in a different nebula. That's right, which they eventually do find. Um, you know, apparently they put the creature, this uh, entity, in an isolated environment on deck twelve, of course. Yeah. Uh, so that, of course, of the course, haunting of deck twelve makes sense. Yeah. Yep, and so that is where the creature resides until they find the new nebula, and you know they're able to take it and release the creature back into the, its new nebula home. Yeah, and, and this is then where we see uh, you know Neelix talking about this. The lights all come up, and. Uh, main powers restored, and the Borg kids get up and they go back into their alcoves to finish their regeneration. And you know, Neelix kind of tells them, you know, it probably was the alien leaving the ship, um, to take up residence in some other nebula. Yeah, uh, that the new captain found for it. That was probably the reason for the whole power drain, kind of to give them a little bit more of one more little poke and say, yeah, you know, this is this is really why the power was went out it was really something to do with this alien that had been being held on deck 12 just kind of give him one more little scare yeah um and so neelix tells them you know look like he made the whole thing up and and so forth and they go to close their eyes they start their regeneration cycle and neelix says pleasant dreams or whatever and he goes back to uh the bridge everything's back to normal everybody's in their normal seats and everything else and they ask him, hey, you know, how the how the children handle the blackout? And he says, you know, he kept him occupied with his story. Paris asks him if uh, it was Mother Goose 
And I love I love the response by Neelix here. He says, certainly not. Some of those fairy tales can be frightening. Ogres yeah. and child-eating monsters? Speaking of which, is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like he says he made the whole story up to the kids, but then he's asking if everything's okay because he probably didn't actually make that up. It's probably – there's some truth to that story that he told the Borg kids. Yeah, yeah. And, and I like that it, there's a little bit of ambiguity uh, at the end because – He's on the bridge and you know they're doing something yeah. and perhaps they've released the creature back in to the nebula. Yeah. I, I love it, the the line at the end too where he says, well, I hope it lived hap it lives happily ever after. Yeah. Like a fairy tale, right? Yeah. And that's where it, it resumed that, that then Voyager warps off and resumes towards Earth. But uh, yeah, this was a really great um, episode. If you're watching or listening uh, to us, I really think this is – a must view either prior to Halloween or on Halloween night. It's just, if you don't like the horror movies and the gory stuff and all that stuff, which I'm not a fan of. And I know, I don't think you are either, Chris. Mm -mm. Um, this is the good type of episode, a good thing to watch, especially if you're a science fiction fan to watch. Uh, it definitely gives you the jumps. It gives you some creepiness. It gives you some spookiness. I think it gives you all the feels of what you'd be looking for as you get closer to Halloween. Yeah, and it's not connected to the main arc of Voyager or the main, you know, main story. And it's not a, it's not a heavy, heavy episode. It's just one yeah. to like enjoy, I yeah. think, and enjoy for what it is. It's one where you turn the lights down low or turn them off and light a candle and or something, right? Have low lighting and, uh, you know, curl up with a blanket, watch this episode, enjoy some, you know, sci fi spooky scary if you're a trek fan also a great option as well um i think this is a a really really good choice um it will be on our list uh of of must view episodes and sci of science fiction for halloween yeah the week of halloween when that episode comes out so you will see this episode on there but um yeah there's some there's some great scenes in this it it really does give you that kind of spooky campfire story type of feel to it and i th I think it, it's wonderful and i'm glad we we talked about it um here in october it, and it's a unique episode in um all of the star trek series because uh, i mean there are children there are children throughout the star trek series but like not a lot right so yeah. so this makes really good use of the children that are in voyager and makes really good use with the uh, with the age differences that are in Voyager in this like neat neat setting that is familiar to everybody, like a uh, campfire setting where you get to tell ghost stories. Yeah, it really has that feel, and I I can't I certainly myself cannot recommend this episode enough. If you're looking mm -hmm. for something like this to watch, um, it's it it really fits the bill of uh, what you may be looking for as we approach uh, Halloween here in October. Yeah. yeah, we hope everyone sees it and enjoys it. I I think so too. Uh, and if you're a Voyager fan, especially if you're a big Voyager fan, you you know exactly what this episode's about, and it's it's a fun a fun rewatch too as you're going through this. But we do hope you enjoyed this. Um, this has been awesome, Chris. Uh, if if you're watching this at the time of this recording, um, coming out a week from now, the time of the recording, uh, we're doing another spooky creepy episode that uh we can't wait to share with you so be sure to stay tuned and look out for that one coming soon uh from star trek enterprise it's awesome it is a completely different version of what we would consider as scary so be sure to stay tuned for that and we can't wait to share that coming again at the time of this recording about a week from now nice excellent i'm looking forward to that that's gonna be a fun one Absolutely. So, yes, thank you so much, everybody, for watching and listening to all the Globe and the Interwebs. We appreciate it very much. Again, be sure to go on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and the other podcast platforms to check out all of our latest episodes and anything else you want to watch or listen to. We very much appreciate that. And we'll catch you next time right here on the Random Red Shirt Podcast. <laughs>